All right. Uh, this morning we have a treat, um, and so uh, we have Josh coming to uh, give us the word today. This is a fifth Sunday, and uh, very grateful to uh, have a team who can preach. Uh, and there's several of you guys, uh, Heidi and John and, and others that have that have stepped up to speak at times. But Josh, being our associate pastor, it's particularly uh, awesome for me to watch him grow and to um, be to be able to be there and to watch him. So, come, bring us the word, and uh, we uh, uh, will hopefully uh, we'll, we'll see what you got. Okay. No? <laughs> All right. Come on. <laughs> A lot of faith in that last statement there. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning, everyone. So uh, as I was trying to get this sermon prepared, I knew I had a Sunday com coming up, and I kept praying to God. And I was trying to figure out what God wanted me to do the sermon on. And he kept bringing up J this John 17. I kept coming across it. I kept had other ideas for a sermon, and I kept trying to go to other verses, and God kept bringing me back to this one. So... This is something I really feel like God has a message in here for us. And if you've never read John 17 before, it's a beautiful chapter. It's Jesus saying a prayer for his disciples and for the church that would come right before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and then gets arrested and ends up getting crucified. But um, it's kind of a bit of a long section of verses, so we'll not be doing the whole thing. I wanna, I'm going to be kind of bouncing around through it. But I want to start with, uh, start with verse 20, and we're going to go through the end of the chapter. So it's going to be uh, John 17, uh, verse 20. And it says, I do not ask the, for these only, but also for those who will, who will believe in me through their words, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and, loved, and I loved them, even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory, that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. So Christ's prayer here, and it's really his prayer throughout, this uh, whole chapter is that um, that we would be one with each other so that we can be one with Christ, as Christ is one with God. And it's really a story, it expresses this deep desire. You know, he mentions like it f about four different times throughout this chapter that um, all of them would be one. You know, and he gives the reason f um, in there is that he wants us to be one so that the world may know him through us, you know, so that we would have unity so that the world may know him through us. The unity Jesus prayed for was not just an organizational unity, um, but it was a spiritual unity. So throughout this, chap this chapter, God gives us a list of characteristics and behaviors on the ways that, um, that are universal among those who belong to him or those who are in Christ. These are things that should uh, not only unify us, but be common among Christians. So there are three main kind of categories for these that he puts them in. And one, the first one that we're going to look like is, is that those who are in Christ are in a relationship with him or in a, in a relationship with God. So um, they have experienced true spiritual salvation and a personal relationship with Christ. You guys mind throwing up that slideshow on that first slide there? So in this, he says, so in verse 23 of this chapter, he says, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and I love them even as you loved me. 
So the first thing that separates a Christian from the world is that they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and invited him into their hearts. Romans 8, 9 through 10 words it this way. It says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead, because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So this goes, you know, those who are in Christ, you know, obviously they have to have a relationship with him. We can't be in Christ without knowing who he is and, you know, believing in him. Now, this goes beyond a recognizing that there is a God or that Jesus was his son. Um, it's, you know, it's more than simply believing in God. You know, that's not enough. It's, the Bible says even the demons recognize God. You know, they believe he's real. They know he's real. They're constantly in conflict with him. You know, believing that there's a God is not enough. You have to be in a relationship with him. Or I should say, you have to be in right relationship with him. Because you can be in a relationship with God and be like, I want nothing to do with you. I mean, I suppose that still counts as being in a relationship, but it's you have to be in right relationship with God. You have to have accepted him as your Lord and as your Savior. Um, so, you, so, you know, this is that, that's that first thing is having Christ in us. Uh, verse 26 of this chapter says, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it, it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. So this, my second little point here is, you know, you have to know and experience the love of the Father and the companionship of Christ. It's not only do you know who God is, but you need to be in that companionship with him. If we are truly in Christ, we will continue to grow in a relationship with him. Uh, John 15, 15 says, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that have heard from my father, for all I have heard from my father, I've made known to you. To, so to be in Christ is being in relationship with him. You know, and it's not simply a relationship of, well, the Bible gives me the list of things I need to do and I'm trying to do them. You know, we're not just servants of Christ. We are servants of the ministry God has given us. You know, we have jobs and tasks and things to do. But we're not just servants of Christ. We are friends of Christ. We are in that relationship with him. And like a friendship, that relationship continues to grow and it continues to change. You know, we're not the same as we were when we first got saved. Someone who is in that Christ or is in that relationship with them, they're going to have change. They're going to have growth as they continue to be in Christ. Because we can't stand in the presence of God and stay the same way we are. The more time we spend in God's presence, the more of us and the more of the world gets washed away, and the closer we step towards that glory of Christ. Um, so that's our first point. So the first point, main point we had was we need to be in relationship with God. And that's what we talked about here leads us into the second point is that relationship with Jesus changes and guides our everyday behavior. So we're going to look at verse uh, 14 through 16 of our chapter here for John 17. And it says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now, Jesus walked this world. He experienced everything that we humans experience on a daily basis you know for 30 years jesus well closer to 33 years because he started his ministry around 30 jesus was a man he lived in the world he was hungry you know he got blisters from walking he had everything we have to deal with all the temptations that we face all of the challenges of life he went through them but he wasn't ever caught up in the world he would never lived in the world for the same sake. You know, he was, his ambitions were not for the thing of, things of this world. It was not to better himself. It was not to be more comfortable. It was not to be secure. If those were any time with Jesus' goals, his ministry would have looked a lot different because he was pretty counter to all of those things and what he did. He was here for a purpose. He was in the world, but he was not a, of the world. Those things that command our earthly behavior, those things that 
the average person who's not in Christ lives for had no hold on Jesus because he was living for a purpose. And in this passage, he says, you know, just as I am not in the wor- of the world, they are not of the world. In the world, but not of the world. So we're in that same book. When we come to Christ, we're no longer of this world. We've been separated from it. We don't live for our own goals, for our own desires, for our own wants and needs. You know, we live for a purpose. Christ has put a call on our life. The basis of that call is go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations. But, you know, so we're supposed to be about that work of spreading the gospel. But even above that, God gives each of us those calls, those desires, those places where he puts us where we can minister, you know, where we can do, be doing the work of the ministry. So that is, you know, that's how we are in the world, but we're not of the world, was that those are the things we live for. Yes, we have to work. We have to have money. You know, housing is always good. Clothes really come in handy. You know, there's all these things we have to take care of, but they're not what drives us. They facilitate the goal that we're about. They're not the goal, or they're, they're not the end goal. They're just something, they're just a resource we use along the way as we pursue the things God has put in front of us. So just as Jesus was in the world but wasn't bound by it, so are we free from the sinful and the self, selfish worldly ambitions that once bound us. We are children and friends of the living God, and we should be about the business of his kingdom. Uh, my next little sub-point here is that they continue to grow in their knowledge of truth and devotion to God's purpose. We're going to look at verse uh, 17 through 19 here for this, the chapter 17 where we're at. And it says, sanctify them in the truth. Your, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And you sent me into the world so that so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. So what is Christ sanctifying us for? Well, to kind of answer that, I want to look at another verse here. And we're actually going to jump to Titus. We're going to look at ch- chapter 2, verse 14. Uh, Titus 2, 14 says, uh, Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. So Lord has sanctified us so that we can be about his good works, the good works he has called us to, which being about that work of the gospel that he has given us to do. Now, I actually went up and I looked for it. So that word sanctify, if you're not familiar with it, literally means to set apart, uh, to set apart as or declare holy or to consecrate. So the Lord has sanctified us from the world. He's set us apart from the world for the purpose of being about his good works you know, being about that work he has given us to do. You know, it's an amazing thing that, you know, God has all the power in the universe, you know, created everything, has all the power, can do what he wants, but he chooses to work through us, you know, and for us being in relationship with him, he sets us apart so that we can do those ministry, that ministry. You know, at any time, God could have decided, you know, things did not go the way I had, you know, first planned when I set this world into motion. And, you know, could have gone with, well, well, I guess we'll, you know, try again or just do something different. But no, he goes through and he wants, you know, he loves us to the point where he wants to make a way that all can come back to him. But just as, you know, all of us are lucky enough that whether it was friends or families or God just directly intervening that we have been come to that point where we are in relationship with God. He wants us to have that same heart and that same passion for those around us. You know, he just desires that none should perish. Now, that doesn't mean everyone is going to be saved. We know not everyone makes it. God makes that plain that, you know, only those who call on his name, who come into that relationship with him, enter into the kingdom of heaven. So that means not everyone makes that decision, but his desire is that all should, would. And that's that thing that he tells us, he wants us to have that heart of Jesus, that heart of God that he asked that, you know, we would have, is that same heart, 
that none would perish, that all would see that kingdom of heaven. Um, next point is they are receiving, believing, and obeying the truth of God's word. So verse, uh, chapter 17, verses 6 through 8 here says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. And let's see, is that the same one I just did? Nope, that is different. I have manifested your name to the people I have given me out of the world. Yours they were, and you have given them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me. They have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. So, not only are we, you know, those who are in Christ, are in relationship with him, they're changed on that everyday behavior, but, you know, that behavior has action to it. It's not just in what they believe, what they think, but it has that physical act, action. You know, we, they obey the words that, they have obeyed the words that I have given them. Well, when we read through the Gospels, when we read through what Jesus says, a lot of his things he says I'll have actions to them. Go into all the world, you know, you know, preach the gospel, you know, spread any name, you know, pray for the sick. All of these things have action to them. So if we are in that, we're in Christ and we're obeying, meaning we're obeying his word for what it says here, that they have listened and they have obeyed my words. If we're obeying those. That means we're putting actions to what God has said. Because most of what God, what Jesus preached to his disciples was not passive. Some of it was information. Some of it was clarifying what the prophets and what other people had said. But a lot of it was, is this is what you need to be about. You know, this is what my people do, is we do this. And this is what he's saying here, is that those who are in me, that they would be about those things that I have called them to. All right. And our, my last key point is, is that they spread the gospel. So those who are in Christ have a desire to bring Christ's message of forgiveness and spiritual salvation to those who do not yet have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, verses 21 through 23 say that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and I loved them even as you loved me. So God's prayer for unity here is really summed up in this. Like he wants us to be, the body to be unified. One, because, you know, we are called to be in love. We're called to be in unity with each other, but there's a purpose for it. He wants us unified so that the, that the world may know that God sent Jesus and that he loved them even as God loved Jesus. So it's like, but for that, he says that, you know, he wants us, that we need to be in unity for that. So our greatest desire as Christians should be to see others come into relationship with Christ. Um, 1 John 4, 13 through 17 words it this way. It says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the father sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of, son, the savior of, the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and believe and love that, the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this love, perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. So, God is love, and as he is, so are we in this world. We are to be love in this world. If we abide in Christ, we will share his gospel with those who are around us. Because we are sharing that love that Christ has shared with us. You know, we desire that all would be saved. So declaring, our, declaring Christ as our Lord and Savior and entering into a relationship with him, allowing uh, 
that relationship to grow and change us, to be about the process of becoming more like Christ every day, and to spread the gospel to anyone and everyone we can, to have a heart that longs that none should perish, but that everyone would have eternal life. These are the three things that should be common among all those who truly believe in Christ, that they've declared Christ as their Lord and Savior, that that relationship that they're in with God changes them on a regular basis and they continue to grow, and that they have the desire and the drive to see others come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, these are kind of pillars of what it means to be in the faith, you know, what it means to be in Christ. These are the things that should unify us. Now, so often we discount other believers or other people because they don't look the same way we do. They don't worship the same way. They don't pray the same way. They don't dress the same way we do when we come to church. And we have this tendency of wanting to either think less of them or to discount what it is that they're trying to do or what, or just even their church because they're like, well, you know, they're, they're not the same. It's like, you know, even if they're Christians, like, you know, they're okay, we're better, you know, kind of thing or something. But it's like, we don't stand in unity. We tend to discount. And if we do this over, you know, s- silly things, but it's like when it comes down to it, it's like, do they declare Jesus as the Lord and Savior of the world? Does their relationship with Christ change them? And are they about the business of seeing lost souls saved for Jesus? If they're about those things, we should be able to partner with them. Doesn't mean we always look the same. Doesn't mean we agree on everything. But it does mean that we should be able to be in some unity with them and stand behind them for the sake of the gospel. Because if they're in those things, if they're following Christ, if they're in true relationship with him and they're desiring to see others the same, you know, that's what Christ calls us to be. When we break it down, that's the core of what it means to be a Christian. The other stuff, there's a lot of extra things in there. And yes, I believe there's a lot of depth to the faith. You know, there are, I have a lot of friends who are not spirit-filled. And I believe there's a power and a, a, a power and an extra emboldenment that comes when you're spirit-filled. Like, you know, that's a, a resource that I would not want to be without. But I don't doubt their faith. You know, I know they're in Christ. I know they're in relationship with him. And I've seen how it's changed them, and I've seen the lives that they affect around them because of their love in Christ. I don't doubt their faith. I don't doubt their relationship with him or that they're going to be in heaven. But, you know, so when it comes down to it, sure, I, you know, I'll go to their church. I'll stand with them if they're doing ministry. If they're volunteering for something, I can be there. It doesn't have, they don't have to look exactly like me or be in the same place as me. Plus, that's the other thing is, if we're believing this and what this says, we grow in Christ as we come along. We don't all start in the same place. When I was a kid, my family, we started off, we were Lutheran. And, you know, yes, you know, we were saved. We believed in God. We had a relationship with him, but that's not where we saved. God kept bringing us along and treated us to this extra depth. You know, there's more to the Bible, more that was there for us to receive. Didn't mean that we weren't saved. Didn't mean that my mom's family, who had started off Lutheran, weren't saved, but it meant that there was more. There was a growth that happened. So just because someone is not at the place where you're at now doesn't mean that God's not going to move them there. Doesn't mean that he's not going to move them necessarily past where you're at, you know, depending on if you're continuing to move forward or not. We're not always in that same position. So we get off on these silly things. Sometimes it's, like I said, it's the things we believe, the way that we act. Sometimes it's as simple of stuff as it has nothing to do with what we believe, and it's all just our political view or our social standing on this issue or not. And for those reasons, we decide we condemn fellow believers. We say, well, you know, if they believe this is fine, or if they're for this politician, or that's okay, then I want nothing to do with them. And we will not only just not associate with them, but we will condemn the ministry that they're trying to do, even if they're still following all of these things for, for Christ, they're still keeping all these pillars, they're still in relationship with him, they're still growing in their faith, and they're still desiring to see people saved for the sake of the gospel, we will condemn them and walk away from them because we don't agree with what they say is right or not. You know, it's kind of like uh, Pastor Brent has been talking about the last few weeks. We get, even as the church, we get caught up in this cancel culture idea, you know, and it's a epidemic that goes around our nation where it's like if we don't like something we just want to make it disappear or we want to 
tear it down to the point where it's no longer, no one gives it any credibility. You know, and it's a dangerous point to have. Because I don't know about all you, but I've been saved since I was getting, like I said, when my family, when I first got saved, um, we weren't Pentecostal. We were been going to a Lutheran church, um, everything else. I don't necessarily believe exactly the same things now that I did then. My core beliefs are still the same. I still believe, you know, Jesus is the son of God, all of these things like what we've gone over here. But when it comes down to some of the finer parts of doctrine, different things and stuff, I don't necessarily believe the same thing I did 15 years ago. I don't necessarily believe the same things I believed exactly seven years ago. You know, God has changed and he has grown me. So it's a dangerous stance to take when we start tearing people down because they don't believe what we believe at the moment when we have to recognize we're still growing in our faith too. So if, they're, if what they're saying is not contra, contrary to the Bible, it's not contrary to our core beliefs and our core faiths, trying to condemn them. Now, there's one thing for going to, you know, you can take that to the Bible, you could try to correct and work through in a relationship, be like, I don't exactly agree with this, or where are you pulling this from? Try to figure it out. Maybe you can figure out, you know, which one of you feels right. You might not come to a resolution on it, but at least you can figure out why they believe that. But to fully just condemn someone for the stance they take, you know, with where you're at now is a dangerous thing to do because you might not be in the same place later on. And I've had to do that before where I've told someone something and then even the course of over a year or so, I had to go back and like, I apologize. I don't think that was good advice. <laughs> it's like at the time, yes, I thought that was the right thing and I agree with it. But even at this point now, I would say I, I would not tell you that again if it was reversed. So sometimes it's, it's funny because we tend to have, as Christians, we have an easier time loving non-believers than we do a brother in the faith who doesn't agree exactly or doesn't see the world or agree exactly the way we do. And I don't know why that is, but we'd rather someone not be a Christian and in our mind be redeemable than someone who is a believer but doesn't look like us. And it, it doesn't make sense. And here, you know, Christ is saying, so he desires that we would have unity. You know, it's, like I said, it's not an organizational unity. It doesn't mean we all have to be one church. It doesn't mean we all have to look the same. It doesn't mean we have to all necessarily behave the same. I believe one of the reasons God allows the church to look so as different as it does throughout all these different denominations and things is because then the church is always there to meet someone where they're at with what they're ready for, for what they can hear God has for them. As long as they're in faith, as long as they believe who Christ is, as long as they're growing in their relationship with God, and as long as they're seeking to see lives changed for the gospel, they're about the work of the ministry, then they're walking in Christ. They're in relationship with him, and we should be able to be, you know, in unity at, with that, or at the very least support that, and not be tearing it down or looking, thinking less of it because it doesn't look like we do. So... My encouragement for this today, as we, you go through your week, as you're listening to, whether it's your political news or the things and stuff that come up on Facebook, is when we get that, we get that initial reaction of being angry at, why, why would someone say that, you know, kind of thing stuff, you know, or going through to write that, whether it's either that disagreement, sometimes it's stuff that we physically say, say sometimes it's just the way that we think. But if we tend to think less of someone, we're going to end up treating them less whether we mean to or not because it's in our mind. So when those thoughts come up, when that point where we don't agree, take the time to think about it. Is what we disagree, does it have anything to do with their relationship with God? Or is it just as that result of something outside of it? Is it just because their, their politics are different? Or is it just because the way that they walk out that faith is different? But does it have any, you know, do we doubt that their faith is in God? Do we doubt their relationship with God? And if we're in relationship with them and we think that they're walking, you know, they're getting off, then sure, you can talk with them. See, you know, try to steer them back or at the very least figure out why they think that this is the right direction to go. But if we're not in relationship with them and they are walking in faith, they're keeping these pillars, we probably have no biz business getting involved with trying to tear them down or correct someone on Facebook. You know, you can't correct someone you're not in a relationship with. It just, it doesn't work. So, you know, we have to be about the work God has put in front of us. You know, make sure that we are using, you know, 
some of these things, the, the internet and other things and stuff to do as a tool for being about God's ministry and not as a tool for just expressing our opinion or being mad at people who don't have ours. So, and my encouragement is, is just search your heart as you're going through, you know, make sure that one, for you, maybe you're looking at these, you know, listening to these today and you're worried that you're not in that relationship, whether it's someone here or it's someone online, and that you're not sure if you line up with those core beliefs, you know, those things that, you know, that you've declared Jesus your Lord and Savior, but that you haven't, you're not seeing that change that he's making in you on a regular basis, or, you know, you've not been about that work of doing it. If you need prayer this morning for that or for anything else, um, we're going to open up the altars here, you know, we'll come for, you know, forward and pray for you. If you're online and you need someone to talk to you, reach to, out to us on Facebook or something like that. We'd love to try to, you know, touch bases with you and to try, you know, to talk with you. It might be that, you know, you just need someone to bounce questions off of or you want to, uh, you know, discuss what has not been going correct in your life. You know, we'd love, you know, to be able to pray with you. Um, but I'm going to open up the altars here for prayer time, whether it's you want something prayer related to the sermon, um, if you need prayer for healing this morning, um, whatever you would need prayer for. I just ask if uh, Pastor Brent wants to come up and both of us or one of us will uh, pray for you guys today. George, do you mind coming up and strumming for us a little bit? close this part of our service. Everybody just extend a hand. Let's just pray a, a blessing over you guys this morning. God, we thank you right now that the power of God has been here today, that your Holy Spirit has touched our hearts and minds. And Lord, right now, I just ask you to just bless each and every person in this room. And God, that right now, as they walk out, Lord, it's, it's more than just financial. It's more than just... Um, material blessing, but Lord, that spiritual blessing that we have access to, as Josh talked about today, salvation and life everlasting, Lord. And God, we worship you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Josh.